Does eating protein cause heart disease? Hi, I'm Dr. Eric Westman and welcome back to my channel where I review and debunk nutritional information online. In this video, we're actually going to watch an influencer who is pro-keto, pro-low-carb, take apart a study that was apparently going to show that protein caused heart disease, but it didn't. But there are a lot of useful things to learn here. Of course, my agenda is to get you to understand how to critique studies so you don't need me to sleuth out the good and the bad science. It was everywhere, in the New York Post, a bunch of other news outlets. I literally saw it on the news. Protein causes heart disease. Closed book, done. Protein, that's it. And this comes from a study that was published in Nature. So this is Tom DeLauer, who is a keto, low carb proponent, an influencer, a, a good one. And he's going to be looking at a study that was published in the journal Nature, which of all the journals is a good one. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be appropriate to draw conclusions for humans, however. I always consider the source of the influencer, you know, whether they used keto the same for the same reason that you're using it, for example. Also consider the source of the science. And so let's dive in. Anyone that has any scientific rigor in their life whatsoever was able to look at this study and almost laugh. So the study was published in the journal Nature, which usually publishes some decent stuff. So I'm surprised that they published this. It was a whopping 23 person study. So not very big. Okay, it had two different study arms. And what they were aiming to set out was, would extreme, quote, extreme amounts of protein be linked to heart disease? So two different study arms. One study arm consumed a, what they called more mixed food, real world scenario. And the other arm consumed an extreme protein diet, which was more liquid protein that they gave to them after an overnight fast. You wanna know what they gave them? Okay, I'm gonna read you a quote from the study. This was what they defined as a protein liquid meal. Varying amounts of Boost Plus from Nestle. I mean, the only people that I know that are drinking Boost Plus are people that like, need to put weight on, like need to get the calories in. That's why it's created. They also use something called Injury, which I'd never heard of. Uh, soul carb, which was like a carb polymer. They used uh, canola oils, corn syrups, they used glucoses, and they were basically making a non-fat dry milk and they were making a concoction of a liquid meal for them to consume. What they did is they made this into a concoction with either 10% protein or an extreme amount of protein at 50%. Then they drew their blood at one and three hours and they were measuring basically what's called mTOR C1. mTOR C1 is just sort of the growth signal that happens when you eat pretty much any food, but definitely happens when you eat protein. That's why protein builds muscle. And they saw whenever there was protein, whenever there was food in general, but more protein led to a bigger spike, bigger activation of mTOR C1 in what is called a macrophage or a monocyte. So what we hear is the different formulations of diets to be able to get control of the macronutrient mix, they're using different formulated diets, which Tom's going crazy about because it's not real food. But I agree with that too. But the main concern that I have is, as he's alluding to, he hasn't said quite uh, as forcefully as I would have by now, is that the major outcome is one in three hours after ingesting the meal. There's no heart disease here. And so eating protein causes heart disease is the, the major fallacy of the study is what's called an intermediate outcome or a surrogate outcome. You're not actually measuring heart disease. You're measuring a signal or a, a hormone or a, a biomarker in the blood that is supposedly then going to be causing the heart disease or is associated with heart disease. So using a surrogate marker 
is our intermediate marketer has done all the time in order to do studies that are, are cheaper, quicker, and yet it really doesn't tell us about that this person is going to get heart disease. It's an intermediate marker. We've seen this done with cholesterol levels, with, with even blood sugar studies after meals, that sort of thing. So there's no heart disease being measured in this study. It's all about surrogate outcomes. I would dismiss it just on that alone. Number two, even if, hypothetically, mTOR C1 activation in a macrophage or a monocyte was bad, how much? How much is bad? So right now we're just saying that any amount is really bad. That's sort of like saying, if you spike your glucose at all, you're diabetic. That's like saying if you sit down right now and you eat a sweet potato and your blood glucose goes up, I can safely and officially label you a diabetic. Come on, you know that's not true, right? That's essentially what we're seeing here. Or even worse, it's like saying, well, that mouse ate a potato and his blood sugar went up. So if you eat a potato, you're gonna be diabetic. That's more like what it is. <laughs> yeah, I'm shocked as well. So uh, whenever you see an effect, you wanna ask what is the magnitude of the effect? How strong is the effect? So to, just to call out something that's a surrogate marker, therefore it's bad, is, is really sad. And you know, keep in mind, there's no filter in the media. The media does not filter out whether there's good science or not. They'll just take, because it was in a you know, reputable journal, they'll take it as if it was the same as a randomized controlled trial in humans uh, that's adequately powered and has great hard outcomes but you have to be a better consumer than the media is going to be. It reminds me of when someone came to a meeting, a very prominent internet persona, and said basically, this food causes inflammation, and this food causes inflammation, and that food causes inflammation. So I'm just not gonna eat anything, literally. That's what he said. But so he basically said, I'm gonna be fasting, and intimated that he wouldn't eat anything at all, because eating something causes inflammation. So that, that's taking it to the absurd extreme. Unfortunately, or unfortunate for us, the, that person left the meeting and we were left the next couple of days talking and, and reassuring people that yes, it's okay to eat food, even if it causes a little inflammation because you have to eat food to live, to survive. And so here, when I saw this title as well, I thought, well, you need protein. We're made of protein. How much protein causes heart disease, but you know, living causes death. You know, so should we not live because it will cause death? <laughs> so you can see that extreme and uh, the problem of using a surrogate marker instead of the heart disease outcome that the study says it involved. It didn't at all. If something was problematic or something was even causing this spike in mTOR, do you think it was like, the protein, or do you think it could have been the glucose syrup, the sugar, maybe the soy lecithin, maybe the carrageenan, maybe the corn syrup, maybe canola oil, how many did I list already? So this is a problem of confounding, meaning they didn't really isolate just protein as an experimental variable. There were all these other things involved, which is a great true criticism. We have countless studies, countless bodies of evidence that show us that cardiometabolically protein and, or just at least reducing your fat mass is tremendously beneficial, especially when it comes down to inflammation. But let's talk protein and inflammation for just a second, because inflammation is really one of the bigger drivers, if not the driver for atherosclerosis and heart disease. So the journal Nutrients had published a paper where for 10 weeks they had subjects take a straight up leucine supplement. They put them in leucine supplementation Okay, the pure amino acid that is in question in this study before, okay? And what they found, there was a 59% reduction in C-reactive protein, inflammation, in the subjects that took the leucine compared to control. So when you actually have leucine here, it's actually driving down inflammation. Well, I thought leucine was problematic. I... <laughs> well, of course, a limitation of that study is that it was only 12 weeks or 10 weeks and it was intermediate outcome, again, not heart disease, the, but the point of it was to look at the effect of the food on inflammation. Hopefully it didn't say that it 
would reduce heart disease because that's not what the study involved. So like what I'm saying here is, hmm, maybe protein actually helps control our glucose more, helps make it so our insulin is actually working in a typical normal fashion and not chronically elevated, which is what the real problem would be. But wait a minute, we didn't look at anything long-term anyway. We looked at a one and three hour interval after drinking a Boost Plus drink. I'll see you tomorrow. Well, well done. Great, great critique. And on balance, the study itself had several flaws. One was the overgeneralization that said that this study in mice was going to be relevant to humans and then using a surrogate marker over one meal to see the effect of a food and therefore inferring, overgeneralizing that that meant they would have more heart disease. This got into the press because lack of a filter through the media, they will just look at a journal and if it's a publication, they will say, well, it must be science. Just, it also makes me reflect upon, I'm asked to review papers from time to time. And actually as a author, when you submit a paper, you can ask for specific people to review your paper. And you can specifically ask for certain people to review your paper. And so you can get into these little clicks or, or people who are in the same paradigm or see the same perspective. While this study, if it had nothing novel, it shouldn't have been published. That's one, see one filter of peer reviews. Is it something new? But if there are enough people to say, yes, it's new and it's more relevant today because of all of the other things going on, the peer review process is, can actually be very biased. The higher level journals are less prone to that, but still are prone to a, a paradigm view. So that's why from time to time, new journals crop up to give a different paradigm a fair shake. And so, but you always want to go to the abstract, the methods section, if you're really going to look into what a paper showed. And hopefully this has given you a little background into how to be a detective and, and look at your information consumption about science in a better way. If you like, please like, please ring the notification bell, subscribe so you don't miss out on further content. I'm putting out new information on Wednesdays and Fridays. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And check out AdapterLifeAcademy.com.